what are what is the future what are the trends well this is what this you... is something i spend the great majority of my time thinking about is if we were in january 2025 looking back what have the winners in 2024 done or if we were in i don't know 2030 looking back what are the winners over the last five years done my opinion changes from month to month but it's you know some things stay the same but a couple of the outliers might might adapt but so let's do you want the one year or the five year i'd like the one and then i want the five <laughs> <laughs> okay cool so the one year one is you've got to address all the stuff that's going on with the privacy changes whether you know the whether you want to call it the loss of cookies or the GDPR mm. changes or the deliverability in the email system changes, you can't sit around complaining about it. And there's plenty of people who go, oh, "It's not fair. It's really annoying. Why can't they do this? Get over it." Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? I've got Chloe with me today. How are you doing, Chloe? I am Chloe good. Thomas. I should say so, your surname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm just Chloe. I'm just the one word <laughs> Chloe of e-commerce. No, I'm very cool to be here, Ian. Thanks so much for inviting me on because we have not chatted in far too long. So this is good. It's been a good. while. And yeah. I must admit, we've just spent probably 30, 40 minutes <laughs> talking, haven't we? we and have. we thought we'd better record the podcast. Yeah. Better get going. Well, listen, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you some, I think, interesting probing questions. And rather than starting off with your, you know, introducing you and the big accolade of, of, of the awesomeness and everything, I'm just going to go straight in. I'm going to ask you the first question that I want to know, which is really, why have you kept going with e-commerce after all these years? What is it about this crazy industry that's made you stick at it that is a cracking question i think the the easy answer is the same thing I've, i find a lot of people have with e-commerce is they do something in marketing and then they get into e-commerce and they get to see the actual results of what they do and that marketing through to cold hard cash is very addictive and that certainly hooked me back in or 20 years ago that hooked me and carried me through an awfully long way. Why am I still in e-commerce now? Because <laughs> uh, that, that certainly accounts for 10 to 15 years would be purely just the numbers and the excitement of trying to play around with the numbers all the time. Um, now it's, I guess there's, there's, there's two parts to it now. One is the, God, could I actually be, do I actually have the energy to start again in something else? I'm just kind of stuck it. here now, very happily <laughs> stuck here, but I'm kind of here. So, you know, you kind of look and you go, should I, should I renovate that house and keep improving that house? Or do I build a new one from scratch? I think I'll stay in the one I've already got because it's nice and comfy. Um, and, but the other bit is the sustainability piece. I think that's why I'm still here now. That's what gets me the most excited now. And I had a, a dark weekend a couple of years ago when I attended a climate conference event, which had a lot of the depressing side of climate in it and went, oh my God, retail is horrendous. Maybe I should jack it all in and go and do something else. And how can I be a part of this industry that does so, so much bad? And then I decided maybe I could be a force for good. And that's what's been powering me through for the last few years. So I try and be try and bring more of the kind of like encouraging positive sides to the sustainability discussions in e-commerce trying to encourage brands and retailers to make good changes and to encourage consumers to change their habits because we've got mm. to do both of those things and you can get very very depressed thinking about all of that or you can focus on the goodness and i try and focus on the goodness yeah right, so 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 let's go go back to the start then so you and I have known each other for a long, long time, and we we were interviewed on your your podcast. Yeah. And um, what's it called? I have to just remind me the name. <laughs> so 
such a big podcast. Can't even remember the name. Yeah. I've got two. So there's the e-commerce master plan podcast, which is, um, I have a history of badly naming things. It's also known as e-commerce masterclass, uh, e-commerce mastermind, some people call it, but it's really called the e-commerce master plan podcast, uh, which has been about to reach episode 500 this summer. And the other one is keep optimizing, which is a marketing podcast. So yeah. Wow. Podcast. So you, you have been doing this for a long time because 500 episodes is a so we i think we've done about 200 and that feels like we've been doing it for years yeah uh, so you when did you first start this then i started planning the podcast in 2014 and it went live in 2015 the first one the second one i started planning in 2019 and it went live in 2020 so a while now lots of lots of chat so that 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 i always think then you probably have got more exposure to to more, probably anybody in the entire ecom world of people that you've spoke to and interviews you think. So if I said for all those conversations that you'd had, all those interviews that you'd had, which were the ones, which were the moments that you went, oh my God, that's really changed the way that you've thought or just blew, blew your mind and just went, you know what that is? What, what what's with those? Bring us back to those. Uh, oh, that's a tricky one. See, up to about three hundred episodes in, I still had an encyclopedic knowledge of all interviews. <laughs> I no longer have an encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of all interviews. There's a point between three and four hundred where the brain just goes, no, 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 no. We can't recall yeah. all this anymore. But I guess, I guess two of the standouts. Um, one was interviewing Michael Gerber of the E Myth, and. Right just being i mean the interview is still out there we are kind of arguing through quite a, a substantial yeah. portion of it because i'm trying to get him to say something and he's completely not agreeing with me and i just yeah. what i but what i took from that was what a consummate professional he was in terms of sticking to his story and sticking to what he wanted to get out of it whilst doing it in a very polite way. I mean, it's a very un- subtle undercurrent, the fact we're not agreeing, but he was so on focus, on brand, on message, but without doing that annoying thing the politicians do where you ask them about A and they tell you about Z. You know, it was just, it was a really impressive way he was responding to my questions that were trying to take him over here and he was keeping me where he wanted to keep the conversation, which was really fascinating. And then at the end, he tried to sell me into his mastermind, which I was just like, that is a man who knows what his, his aims nice. and goals are here. Um, that was after we finished recording, you won't hear that bit. So that was, that's one that just has always stuck in the mind. And that's several years ago now. The other one, or the other ones are, it's, it's not one episode in particular. It's the ones which really hit me are the, they're the guests who have such a clear focus on where they want to be and what they want to achieve. So the, the e-commerce brands who have a super clear vision, mission, values, objective, I mean, you can call, you can use whatever words for that you want. And sometimes it's about values and purpose. Sometimes it's about sales and targets and markets but it's the ones who've got that clarity and during the course of the conversation you can tell they're not just saying they've got a clarity of vision mission etc they've actually got it because you can listen to every Mm. single answer and they all stacks up to what they want to do and i think i think that resonates with me because it's something which i think a lot about now i've got what two podcasts a website a webinar series a speaking um income stream and trying to work out how do we pull all this together what's the right structure for it or what's it all trying to achieve and is it cohesive so i think about that personally quite a lot but also from a successful e-commerce brand standpoint as we're in this more competitive space that we're now in with the economic issues we're dealing with it's it's what's going to separate the winners from the losers over the next 10 years you know we're not in that world where you go oh, I've looked at some Amazon reviews and people didn't like this about the nutcrackers. So I've designed a different nutcracker and I'll spend a hundred grand on Facebook ads. And woohoo, I've got a business. We're we're not in that world anymore. Mm. We're in a world where you've got to have more to your business and a clearer view than just making cash 
to succeed to navigate you through all the many many questions and deliberations we now have in this industry so i think it's those yeah. ones um that that kind of stick out to me and it's definitely matured hasn't it our our, our e-commerce industry because mm. i think you're right going back probably even you know 10 years maybe even more frequently you know in some cases there was a time where just being online was it was it was the strategy yeah you know that was it it and was... it's obviously a lot more, a lot tougher now. So, what what were you what were you arguing with Michael Gergerber about? Um, I the e -myth was man. so the fundamental of the e myth is that you should be trying to expand at all times, and you should be trying to bring on more people, and you should be trying to franchise. And big is the only option, right? Whereas I'm a fundamental believer in the one person business, and that you know having uh, uh, you know, you plus clever freelancers who you bring in to do the right things. I believe you can be very successful that way. And for, certainly for me, that is a much more happy way of being than to try mm. and build out a team of 30 people and then franchise it to Australia and then franchise it to the USA. That's not for me. So I was trying to suggest this and they were basically saying, no, okay. Chloe, <laughs> you should be trying to franchise. You should be trying to grow, grow faster. You should Brilliant. be trying to employ more people. I was like, but I don't want to, Michael. Yeah, um, and he was. Basically I remember reading. I, I remember reading that book, probably about twenty years ago, and it was one of those books that you do really think, right, wow. But then I've, I think I've probably spent twenty years trying to implement the first chapter and failing. <laughs> it is. It's a really brilliant book, and I was I was interviewing him about the next one in the series or another one that had come out, which holds to the same this. I think it, it's a brilliant example of business books because it brings story in really, really well. I still, it was yeah. the very first business book I read and I still have the vision of her crying, leaning against her cookie baking, um, baking uh, machine, oh, not yes. machine, cooker. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. I still, I can still, that still resonates with me. And the idea of, you know, of that, that, um, building out the, the the chart of the company and working out which boxes you shouldn't be in and how do you get yourself out of those that is a principle i fully um adhere to and i think everyone should be doing that no matter what size business you want to build but the idea that you then have to keep replicating it over and over and over again mm. for the good of the world and society i think is fundamentally wrong mm. and um you know what's funny i think yeah. um about e-com brands. I think, you know, cause quite often we're talking to e-com businesses that are doing five, 10 million. And they're actually, you know, in terms of work workforce, they're tiny. You know, they might have three, four, five people and they're yeah. doing, you know, six, seven million. Um, and I, I think that's quite common. And I, I think it's more and more common, whereas going back five or six years ago, you know, actually from, even from like technology, you'd need, you know, five developers, you know, sysadmin, um, you know, marketers. And, and that actually you do so much more yourself now. Yeah, and, and I think um, that, that was another thing that I was, that it wasn't just about my own desire to be a one-person business that was causing me to disagree with him. It was also that for e-commerce, you don't franchise an e-commerce business. And you don't, you know, going into another country is not a duplication of what you already do. It's a pretty yeah. major shift. So, or, you know, or going wholesale is a, it's not a duplication or a franchising. It's another major shift. So I'm not entirely sure that book in the series really stacked up for the e-commerce space. It wasn't mm. just a selfish disagreement. Now I remember it. No. Probably. <laughs> Someone's going to listen back and email. I'm, I'm going to listen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to listen back. <laughs> so on, so going back to all of these interviews and the people mm. that you chatted, what, what were the game changes then? What were the biggest shifts that you think you've seen? What was like? You know, was it a slow game changer or was it like a, oh my God, this has come in and it's changed it all? What's, what, what about that? See, I think e-commerce, I get, when you've been in the, you must get this as well, Ian, when you've been in the industry for like 20 years, over 10 years, you get asked all the time, so much mm. must have changed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and I find certainly for the first 15, 18 years, very little really changed, right? The, we were still we still are now trying to solve the same problems we're still trying to build a greater connection with our customers in order to increase 
increase lifetime value and increase sales. We're still trying to cut through the marketing noise, but there's more noise than ever before. We're still trying to build a decent welcome campaign. We're still trying to build decent follow-up marketing and post-purchase campaigns and get the box to the right person at the right time, not wet or ripped. Um, so the great majority of the problems we're trying to solve are exactly the same. Consumer behaviors shifted, but it's it's not on a lot of the fundamentals haven't changed of how consumers behave. The biggest shift that's happened in the first 18 years of my career has been how much easier the tech is. As you were just yeah. saying about you used to have a whole load of developers in the yeah. room. Now you just need a, you know, you don't need that anymore. It's so much easier. I remember trying to spec out an email welcome sequence and it took us a day to write the brief. It took a week or so for the developers to come back. They quoted us 10 grand and we went, no, and that's where it ended. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, you can you can sign up to a tool for pittance and have it up and running within two hours. Yeah. If you even if you've never done it before, and a lot faster if you have. So I think what we can do has become a lot a lot easier. But I think we still fail to do a lot of the stuff we can we should do, even though it's become easier. Then in the last, all of that still holds for the last few years. But I think the last few years we've seen we're seeing two big shifts that are really two slash three big shifts that are really changing the industry one is the sustainability becoming mainstream and i hate the word sustainability so when i say it guys please consider catch all for anything green or good for the planet and people as well as profit um so you've got the sustainability movement which is accelerating but is causing huge confusion as to what we do and is going to be huge ramifications in how our industry shifts and changes and you've got uh, the huge amount of competition we've now got which we were on a competition increasing market evolving trajectory anyway the pand i think the longest legacy of the pandemic for our industry is going to be the huge amounts of people who started selling online during the pandemic who are still selling mm. online and it took it from a nice to have on a lot of people's strategy lists to a high level strategy obviously during those couple of years and then they've seen the opportunity and they've continued doing it well or badly but they're still there so i think that is is a big shift and it's where we're having to go it, it's no longer a land grab if you think of the wild west it was like everyone was going out there grabbing new land it was really easy and then mm. all of a sudden they ran out of land to grab and they had to start competing with each other and we're in that space mm. now so we've got to be better marketers and then I guess the third one, if I was going to put a third one in of what's happening right now, um, it would be that the tech arena is massively shifting. I think we had the first big tech shift, which was Shopify came in and everyone, went, whoa, really? That easy? And the barriers to entry just sank through the floor. Mm. Um, now we're kind of diversifying again. And there seems to be more noise from alternative platforms than ever before if you think for most of the last 10 years it's been magenta or shopify it's pretty much mm -hmm. been it we've now got a whole plethora of other options out there and more seem to be trying attempting to enter the market all the time so there's lots of different ways of now doing your main site but around that partly as a direct result of the impact of the shopify ecosystem we've now got some amazing low price tech that is enabling us to do amazing things. And I think as we move into a competitive arena, our data is critical to being successful from efficiency standpoints and customer connection standpoints and all that kind of stuff. And that comes back to how well your tech stack is glued together and how well you pick the bits that glue together. So I think we're in a really, in an era where take, tech can really enable you, but if you make the wrong decisions, it will, um, slam the brakes on your business and really hold you back from doing anything else but that was mm. quite a long rant ian um no no we're <laughs> not I'm nodding ahead I'm, my neck hurts I'm, I'm nodding no you, i think you, you're definitely right i think it was it was one of the podcasts you were talking about and you you talked about the phrase it was a long time ago called the the, the growth of no code and i think i don't know if you came up with that um no but i didn't come some... up with that that wasn't <laughs> that was give a, it to you then it's a it's a very it was, it's a big thing, though, isn't it? I mean, it's like... Yeah, well, it's... Honestly, mad. go back to where... What we were, you know, doing, you know, 10, 20... Or, well, not 10 years ago. Like you say, you know, anyone who wanted to go and trade online before Shopify came along, um, you know, probably needed to spend, I don't know, 
50, 100,000 mm-hmm. pounds to get a website and it would take six to, tw- six to 12 months. And the yeah. Shopify came along and went, oh my God, you can do that pretty much in a couple of days. <laughs> it yes. be up and running. Honestly, and I think techie people, and for me, because I, I was running an agency at the time, and I, looked, I was like, holy smoke, this is going to like totally change the way the whole agency world works. And, and, the, and the things that you could achieve yeah. in, in, these, in this time to such a high level was just, was just mind-blowing. But you're right, what happened, wasn't it? They all got, you know, everybody got stuck and it's now we're competing for, against I the land, aren't we? That one of the big things, because at the time I wasn't running a, I've, you know, I've never built websites for people, but I used to do quite a lot of project management of site builds. I must have done 10 or 15 of them in maybe five or six years. So being mm. on the, being very deep in the weeds a bit, but without actually having to do the coding. And one of the things I just found mind boggling about the Shopify approach back in those early days was what they, there's, there were whole chunks that we'd spend weeks debating, mm. like payments, checkout design. Um, all these kind of nitty gritty stuff, which you just weren't allowed to play with. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. from someone who sat between techies and client with these just l- ludicrously in-depth chats where no one actually knew the answer, trying to work out what payment methods we were going to have or where this button yeah. was going to go in checkout. And somehow Shopify had had the audacity to go, no, 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 no. That you've, you've got this and you're just going to have to deal with that. Yeah. Was, that was yeah. quite mind-blowing as well. Was They just went, you don't need to deal with this. This is not important. Go yeah. and play with something tick else. Box. It was mad. It was yeah. literally a tick box. I remember trying to integrate you know, MailChimp or, or Clavio into some Magento taking about you know, three weeks. Shopify literally mm. press, press the button and it's done. Oh. So, that's, yeah. it's a, so, I mean, it's amazing. That, I think you're right. Absolutely big, huge shifts in there. Um, going back when it's so what about the lows then what about what about the tough spots you've seen people get into in e-commerce I like think, what, what happened there oh I think that the the bad times are usually and I'm not gonna I don't think I'm gonna name any names we'll see where we go um I'm gonna try not to uh, I'm gonna think, I'm definitely gonna ask you now <laughs> I think the bad the bad times are when people put too much emotion in and they don't make the right decisions. So there is, you know, you can have the best idea for a product in the world and you can have a marvelous customer base, but until you actually start trying to do the business and to sell to the customer and to do the marketing and you you discover how much that costs in the real world and how much the customer is willing to buy in the real world, you get the best idea in the world, but it might not work on pay. Or, you know, the financials might not work out. And I think mm. too many people go, oh, I have to make this work. This is good. The customers like it. And they forget to go, well, yeah, but our AOV is £10 and our cost to acquire is £8. This is clearly never, and the, the customer yeah. only buys once every two years. This is clearly not a viable business. And I think people get too attached to the emotional stuff, which you have to do to get right but they don't look at the numbers. And, you know, over my career, I've been involved with a few companies that have gone under. I've worked for companies that have gone under and frequently it's been bad strategic decisions, not based on the numbers, not seeing the writing on the wall. Mm. And I think that's when, when the worst things have happened. And I know, you know, I'm seeing more, more closure notices, I think in the last 12 months of e-commerce brands than I've ever seen before. And when I get them, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm sad, but I'm thinking, well, thank goodness you worked it out now and you didn't continue flogging that dead horse for yeah. another 12 months. Cause that's when you really get into the, the bad things and the bad financial scenarios when you don't know when to quit. So I think, you know, that's where the, where the tough things come is not seeing how you need to evolve because you've got, you're too emotionally attached to what you're currently doing yeah. to evolve in the way you need to go. You're not, you're not seeing the numbers. I totally I totally, totally agree. And also, I think during like lockdown, there was a lot of free money, wasn't it? That was mm-hmm. that was given uh, from you know VC venture capitalist firms, and obviously then you know that's disappeared. And you know beneath it, you, the fund, the maths don't work. In, not in all cases, but it's you know, and they, you know no amount of emotion and energy is going to resolve that. If the fundamental mathematics of the business doesn't work. But yeah, I think that's the the cleverest business owners. I'm not going to say entrepreneurs, I'm going to say business owners, the people who really make it work 
are the ones who go, right, this is working now. I understand this is working because I can buy traffic at this price from Facebook and that stacks up with what I'm doing. Or I can buy traffic at this price from TikTok and that stacks up. But I'm going to, I'm happy riding this wave but I know this is a wave I'm riding and it's going to end <laughs> at which point I need to make a clever decision. Mm. So there's a lot of this going on in Amazon world at the moment with Amazon really changing their fee structures at the moment, which is wiping out some people's business models. Now you can make the, that decision going, right. Okay. I get where I'm at. Can I afford to play the new game or do I need to, to come up with something else? Which products does that wipe out and so forth? But all people who are going, right. I know I'm what riding this wave will, We'll take that cash and we'll turn it into something more long term. And I think that's the that's a super important thing to do that turns you from someone who's just a bit lucky to someone who's actually got that long term vision. And I think that's increasingly what it's going to take to be successful in this marketplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So if you probably that's probably answering the next thought in my head. So. Of the successful ones, you mentioned a few successful and a few. Because what's most interesting isn't that's fun. Let's cut to the chase. Is who's who's doing really well, and who's doing badly, and sometimes who's doing badly, who's got it wrong is is you know is very interesting to learn from. But what, do you see? Because you spoke to so many, do you see? You alluded to it before, where you said the ones that are successful tend to have this very clear visions, very clear plan, know exactly where they're going. But also that you know that but they could also be going wrong, <laughs> but yeah. still have vision, couldn't they? So, what are the habits then? Who's who's you know? Do you see commonalities between the the ones that grow and then the commonalities between the ones that fail? I think the um, that's such a big question, um, and mm. I'm trying not to give you an annoying answer, <laughs> <laughs> but. I think the, for me, the, the biggest commonality is of the successful ones is yes, they have that, they've got that longer riding vision of what they're trying to achieve because actually, sorry, let's come back a step. You say who's successful and who's not. I think it all depends on what your definition of success is for starters. Um, mm. Because I've, I've one thing I've learned is people's definitions of success vary massively of what someone thinks is successful and what someone else thinks is successful. You know, is it 10 million turnover? Is it enough money to keep the kids in school um, and, and with shoes on their feet? Or is it something else? You know, there's very different scenarios for what success is. But generally speaking, if we assume it's to, you know, to be running a, a uh, sustainable in terms of financially viable business, that's got some growth potential, then I think the, the real commonalities are that they know what they're trying to achieve in terms of that trajectory of the business, the values, the mission and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they've also got a good eye on the numbers, which means that they know they've got a good idea of when to stick and when to twist. Mm -hmm. To avoid using the phrase, they know when to optimize. So <laughs> they know when to go, yeah, we're going to stick with this strategy or when to go, okay, the writing's on the wall here. It's time for me to do something else. Or they see, as we're seeing at the moment, the, you know, the growth of TikTok shop and arguably the massive amount of funding TikTok is, is giving brands in order to buy one incentive or another to inc increase the amount that's going through that marketplace. Seen that opportunity gone, right, we're going to play in that place for a bit and we'll see what happens, but that's a test budget. It's not our business as usual budget, but we'll see what happens. And I think it's it's those who 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 know their business well enough to be able to make the right decisions about what they should do out of all those many, many, many things we could do. Yeah, is um, is what it comes down to. There's a slide that keeps appearing in my presentations at the moment, which is the should could slide which is where I think, to be honest, all business success comes down to, because as we were talking about, sorry, audience, it's going to be annoying before we hit the record button. Um, <laughs> there are like a million and one things any of us could do. And the longer you're in business, the more things become potential. And your success comes partly from learning how to say no to things, but also working out what you should do from all those 20 million things that you could do. I mean, like I put out two podcasts a week 
right? So that's 140, 104 podcasts a year. In each of them, there are four, four uh, question top tip section. So there's a minimum of eight ideas, even if the guest didn't say anything useful in the first mm. part of the interview, which trust me, they do. So there must be like, there's probably coming on for a thousand, easily a thousand recommendations. Just my podcasts are giving a brand a week, a, a year rather. So that's 20 a week or something like that. Sorry if my math has gone wrong, everybody. Um, but that's a huge amount of stuff to try and filter down to work out what you should be doing. And that is where knowing your reason for existing comes in. I was talking, I was interviewing with, to hopefully make this make a bit more sense. I was talking to a, uh, interviewing someone last week whose business makes underwear and they're very ethical and sustainable and all that kind of stuff. And their kind of raison d'etre is to end period poverty, right? So there's, um, in parts of the world, because women don't have pants, they can't go to school what is there when it's that time of the month for hideous reasons. And therefore they're not, they're not learning 25% of what everybody else is learning in those schools. So it's having a serious impact on their lives and their potential. So they're looking to, to, to do that. And she was talking to me about this in the interview and we were, she was saying how 90% of the, their sustainability vows, their sustainability mission, their ethical piece, their B Corp status is table stakes now. And their USP is the period poverty piece. Mm -hmm. So they are in the process of changing all their marketing to refocus it on actually what is their guiding light. And the rest of it is just business as usual. And that's yeah. the sort of thing, if you want to be successful, whether, you know, the aim is to come up with a brand new widget for something or to convince us all to use shampoo bars, whatever it might be, you've got to have constantly be reevaluating, constantly be working out and drilling down to what the most important things you should be doing are and what's going to, um, going to make you stand out in the market and all that kind of stuff. And that is, that's the big one that separates the winners from the losers mm. and the winners from the, yeah, we did all right. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting, is it? Because it depends on how big the business is, isn't it, too? Because, you know, if, you, if you're just starting out, you know, what your decisions to do next, where to spend the next power is going to be different if you're doing 10 million or 100 million. But the same, what would you... Um, the go same, on, Chloe. The same decision-making process happens. You've just got to be aware of what your potential is and what your options are and, and what works for you. So, so yeah, I think... It, 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 different answers come in at different stages, but I think the decision-making process is still just as difficult if you're yeah. small or if you're large. Oh, totally. It definitely is. And um, you mentioned TikTok shop before, mm -hmm. but like, I won't lead you down this, but you, you've obviously seen that's an interesting piece. But like, if you were, and this is a tough question, but if you were going to start an e-commerce business now, what would you do? <laughs> Oh, or man. what would you not do? Like, well, what would you run a mile from? So I have considered this question so many times over the last 20 years. And the problem is for every year I spend in e-commerce, the list of things I will never touch increases. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's got to fit through the letterbox. Um, mm -hmm. It's got, it would have to be ethical, sustainable, useful these days. Um, you want the AOV to probably be around the 40, 50 pound mark. You probably want it to be a consumable with some level of, of subscription to it. If you want to make life easy, not that subscription is easy. Um, yeah, it'd have to have a good story, be interesting, have a big enough customer base. You know, the list just kind of goes a bit mad. Mm. <laughs> so I think it's highly unlikely I will ever have one now yeah. um yeah. because i just and then, and then it would have to be in a good niche with um with plenty of scope and not many competitors so then it becomes a whole other world of nightmare and pain and um and to be perfectly honest these days i basically run a media company and the p l is a lot prettier in a media company yeah. than it is in an e-commerce no business stock. so um yeah there's no stock there's no logistics. No returns. <laughs> um, you know, a, a lot of the time I managed to be paid before the product's made. So, you know, it's yeah. like, uh, 
the grass is I feel think I'm I'm sitting on some quite green grass. So <laughs> so both the inability to find something I would do in e-commerce and enjoying too much what I'm doing now, I don't think it's likely yeah. I would ever do it. Um and but I do sometimes see things I'm like, God, I wish I'd thought of that. That's a really yeah. cool one that come along. Um probably at the moment loop earplugs is one I have the most jealousy of because that's okay. just a beautiful business, really, really beautiful mm. business, um, but who are helping huge numbers of people as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So you talked about sustainability. I think you mm. talked about sustainability in e-commerce before anybody really talked about sustainability in e-commerce. So where's that, where's that, not just from why, but mm. where has that come from? from you because it's something that's been there consistently why is it important to you personally my you know when you, when you get in when you go and have business coaching and all that kind of stuff they try and drill you down to what your why is or you do the simon sinek thing and what your why is my why yeah. has always been great hatred of waste back when i had my marketing agency the team would laugh at the fact we had an a4 sign that told you how to deal with scrap paper <laughs> so it got put in the right <laughs> box to be reused or recycled or shredded in so we made the best use out of every square centimeter of paper that's how much i care about waste so there's kind of like a and i hate the waste wasted opportunities i hate wasted talents you know it, i have a pretty wide remit for my hatred of waste so that that has always been with me i'm also uh, i'm not I'm both obsessed and not very good with apocalypses. So um, mm. my parents remember me getting pretty freaked out by the AIDS epidemic in the, in the 1980s. Uh, pretty freaked out by those horrible adverts that the government put out on the UK TVs. Uh, look at it on YouTube, everyone, if you've not seen them. They are a masterpiece of marketing, but horrendous. Um, I then got pretty freaked out when Blue Peter did the whole greenhouse warming thing. So it's always been an undercurrent of hatred of climate mm. change and what do we do? And then I, I saw that, um, went on that conference and was got properly, properly slough of despond in the dark for a whole weekend going, Oh my God, what do I do? This is horrendous. And then, yeah, it was, it was pretty much a, a fairly big roll of the dice at the point when we did it, when I did it and announced on the podcast, we were going to be talking about it. I st <laughs> the summer after I started, we did our started talking about it. We did a survey of the audience, and I think we had more climate change deniers listening, and people who just did not care, than we did people who liked mm. the fact we were covering it. So we're very, I'm very careful to stay kind of top of funnel and the happy face of it all, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we talk about how it's helping, helping make people's businesses stronger, how the same decisions are saving them money and making them more profitable, which actually is the case in e-commerce, especially as, as it's evolving. So it's kind of come from a bit of a leap of faith of, hey, I could do this. I could try and be a bit of a push for change in, in, the, in the space, but also from a uh, <laughs> decades entire lifelong fear of such things mm. and if i could do something positive then i can just keep the fear in a little box yeah. so it doesn't affect me too much basically yeah well i think i think it's something that's going to become more and more and more i mean i, I personally think that certain countries are further ahead in e-commerce than others and like um uh, you know, I, 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 portugal for example i went to portugal and i spoke at portugal about e-commerce and they were still like you know competing with um, people buying on the high street just by being online was the reason. And then you go to America and I think they're much further ahead. And I think you look at certain industries over there and, and actually without the why, I think it isn't enough, you know, and it's, it's, it's not just a sustainability thing. It's also a, a, a an essential way to, to drive the revenue you know, I mean, in terms of creating the brand. What we're now seeing, and this has accelerated we've got here a lot quicker than I thought we would as an industry, as a, as a planet is the, a lot of what you now do um, to be a more sustainable brand, like re, re, uh, avoiding overstocks, aiming to sell through more at full price, uh, getting involved in your returns and your buyback schemes. So the full lifetime of the product, 
actually listening to returns and customer feedback so you don't design stupid products again next season that nobody can actually yeah. wear. They want to buy it, but they can't actually wear it. Actually, all of that makes your business more profitable and build mm. a stronger relationship with your customer. So, so much of the ways in which we become a more sustainable retail business actually fundamentally makes you a stronger business that will last for longer. We're seeing consumers wanting much more on this front, caring a lot more. Yes, there's the financial offsetting of it, which is an issue, but they are increasingly interested in buying something that will last for longer rather than being disposable. And the tech has come on massively. I mean, it is it is mad how things which two or three years ago, if you wanted to do them to become a more sustainable e-commerce business were nigh on nightmare tech scenario. Now there's an app for it. And you've probably got three or four to pick from and you can find the one that does it in the way you want to do it. And then bang, it's all sorted. So it's evolving massively quickly and nine times out of 10, probably actually nine and a half times out of 10, a sustainability decision will actually make your business more profitable, which mm. as you mentioned earlier about, you know, the VC money coming out, competition going up, we are definitely seeing a shift in the space towards caring more about profit than growth at all costs, which aligns really nicely. I don't think they're, they're causing each other, but it aligns really nicely with sustainability goals too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so how, looking back at, at all the conversations, and sustainability is a great topic, but looking back at all the conversations that you've had, you have the ability to interview people and therefore get to know people and ask them very probing questions, which I think puts you into a unique position because you have, you have the insight to be able to pontificate over what people are telling you and then think about them. <laughs> so how, how does it, how does it impact you and your own life about being exposed to so many people I mean, at the top of the game it is crazy inspiring i have to say um really inspiring getting to speak to so many so many people i have an infinite list of books that i really want to read now because <laughs> <laughs> of what the guests tell me and i get ideas from them all um Sometimes I'm self selfish and I interview people because I want to learn about the thing that they're doing, especially on keep optimizing. We just did a series on uh, search engine optimization and there's an episode in there about YouTube SEO because when I bought e-commerce tech last year, I inherited a YouTube channel with loads of video content, loads of unreleased video content. And I know nothing about YouTube SEO. <laughs> so I was like, let's do an interview about it. So sometimes it, there's a selfish angle to who comes on, but I think, what I mainly get is is inspiration and uh, anyone who's listened to my show will know we don't necessarily interview the most obvious people. We interview stra strange stores you've probably never heard of, small companies, massive companies from all over the world. So I'm always looking, it annoys all the podcast bookers greatly because they say, who do you want on your show, Chloe, on the e-commerce mastermind show? And I'm like, mm. I want someone interesting with an interesting story who's doing something different in the space. They're like, that doesn't help. I know that doesn't help you, but that's what I want. And I won't know who it is until I see it. So it's, well, I get quite a lot out of the research process and then interviewing them. Um, it's just, it's always fascinating. And like last week I interviewed someone, definitely not naming this person. I was like, oh, I really hope they don't turn up because I just can't be bothered to do another <laughs> interview today. Right? I was uh like, oh. God, I wonder, oh, I, hope, I hope they don't turn up. They turned up on time, eager to go. Yeah. And I think it was one of the most inspiring ones I've done this year. And I was so glad they turned up. So I went from very grumpy Chloe to very happy Chloe over the course of an hour. And if, if the episodes can do that for one person, mm. turn them, you know, they turn it on and they're feeling, God, I just don't know what to do with my business anymore. And they listen to it and they feel uplifted. Like they're not alone and like, they got one idea from it that will help them get through the next few days, then that's, that's fine by me. And I think it's just that inspiration and ideas is what I get from them. Yeah. I don't know if that's a, if that's a weak answer to your question, Ian, but that's, that's the truth. Uh, well, no, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, what you essentially is you interview people that you you're interested in and that you want to hear about. Mm. And I think that's it. 
I mean, you're very lucky because you've got all these consultants who would be charging you thousands of pounds coming on and telling you what to do. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it as well. You know, you, it's it's a great way of learning for my own business is doing it all. Uh, but it does mean I've had to get very good at saying no to people and not letting them come on the podcast. Yeah. As um, as I'm sure you experience as well. The, the endless people who want to be on a podcast is insane. But that's not to stop yeah. anyone from asking because sometimes no. you find a really good one. No, but, of um, course. But you have, it's definitely one of, one of those untalked about podcaster skills is ability to say no to someone who yeah. wants to be on your show. Why? Yeah, it, it does happen. Why would we want you to be on the podcast? It's like, no, nothing at all. You're trying to sell some personalization software or you're trying to sell a payment gateway. I mean, literally. Oh, I get them worse nothing. than that. I've, th this week, I've had someone who is an expert in selling courses to entrepreneurs. I'm like, Nice. My audience have no interest in that at all. No. no. And I once had um, an accountant argue with me when I told him he wasn't relevant to the audience. I was like, we have an international audience. You're not going to talk to them. We, so we don't cover accountancy. And, yeah. uh, and they came back twice to argue the point. I was like, well, if, you <laughs> did, if you didn't, if I said no before, I'm definitely saying no now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, never uh, told. Oh, God, honestly. So... Yeah. I, you know, I, I, let me ask you. Let me ask you one final question, okay. which, which I think, because I think in a way you're quite well known, and th this is an annoying question because I think it's the sort of question that I get asked, but it's a question people want to know, and they want to know what's going to happen in the future. What is the crystal ball, <laughs> and that's what they want to know because the, the, there's a there's a feeling of wanting to know what's coming up and being ahead of the curve mm -hmm. and it's bloody difficult and it also can i'm not going to put words in your mouth but i'm going to put what i'm going to i'm going to make it harder for you because they're going to okay. tell you what what i think you'll probably say um you also have to remember about the shy distractions and what can be a complete waste of time and come down to the fundamental core which is mm -hmm. you know what the customers actually want but what are what is the future <laughs> what are the trends well, this is, this is something I spend the great majority of my time thinking about is if we were in January 2025, looking back, what have the winners in 2024 done? Or if we were in, I don't know, 2030, looking back, what have the winners over the last five years done? My opinion changes from month to month, but it's, you know, some things stay the same, but a couple of the outliers might, might adapt. But so let's, do you want the one year or the five year? I'd like the one and then I want the five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So the one year one is you've got to address all the stuff that's going on with the privacy changes, whether, you know, the, whether you want to call it the loss of cookies or the GDPR mm. changes or the deliverability in the email system changes. You can't sit around mm. complaining about it. I know there's plenty of people who go, it's not fair. It's really annoying. Why can't they do this? Get over it. You can't change it. It's where we're, it's a massive trend of where we're, have, where we're ha heading. For individual consumers, it is a good thing. Um, so you've got to find the ways in which you are happy with tracking sales to understand what impacted those sales channels. So attribution, for want of a better word, because mm. uh, well, it's the word that explains it. And you've got to update your marketing and any technology you need to, to make sure it's stacking up with that. That's something you've got to do in the next 12 months. Mm. Next 12 months, you've also got to get much, much better at talking to the needs and the wants and the desires and the values of your customer base. So to by offering ever lower discounts, you're not going to cut through the noise and get your customers back. You've got to create that connection with them, whether that's quizzes and personalization or great copywriting or video or TikToks or whatever it might be, you've got to find the way to get the messaging right to really connect with the customers and get better at managing your inventory would be the third. Because if we're mm. moving to a world and we are moving to a world where there's more competition and profit becomes all, then profit begins and ends with your product. And it begins and ends with how much you pay for your product, by which I don't mean the individual items, I mean all of it that's sat in your warehouse, and then how much you sell it for. And if you buy it right, then you will sell it for more margin and you will give less discounts. So 
get happier, get get the emotion out of the inventory, get the tech in place to, to help you run it, look at the data, share that with everyone in the business, and that will improve your cash flow, improve your profits and help you make the customers happy. So I'm, as a marketer at heart, I'm becoming increasingly obsessed with how people deal with their stock. So that would, would be my kind of like my, that stuff I think is fixable this year, doable this year. Um, five year now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. The five year piece is a bit more, I mean, obviously those three are going to extrapolate over the next five years. They're not, they're not quick once and done scenarios, but I think the big thing you've got to have in five years time is a tech stack that actually works together. Um, that has the right data in the right places. So as you can optimize product inventory, so you can optimize marketing and data and customer communications across all channels. So you can optimize customer service and delivery in the same way. So you can optimize your promotions. So how you go about making sure that's all in the one place, you build that efficiency into it. So it actually happens. No more of this, putting it in one app, building it in another app, building it in another. It mm. all just happens and gives you the data you need to make the right decisions about who gets what promotions, who gets, gets put what product put in front of them, what you rebuy, what you don't rebuy, how you do all these things that if you get that all talking to each other, it enables your teams to do amazing things because they've got the data there, they can build the reporting that just happens. But it also is, I think, where where AI is gonna, gonna pay off massively for our industry. It's gonna be how the tools that crunch all the data for you do that. That's where the AI is gonna pay off. It's not gonna be writing your product descriptions. It's gonna mm. be understanding that that's the segment this customer should be in. And that's the message that this customer should be getting as they travel through the website, but it can only work if you're putting the right data in. So joining all of that up, that's the big, big thing for the next five years. The other thing over the next five years I'd be building in is in what happens to your products after they leave the warehouse, actual strategy, actually get to grips with that, whether it's returns, whether it's um, buyback schemes, whether it's, donating to charity, whether it's encouraging your customers to use the products more, something in that piece is A, going to be where you're going to find some surprising profit that you didn't anticipate ever, ever knowing or, or needing um, or evaluating, but it's also what consumers are going to be increasingly coming to, to expect. And within the next five to 10 years, I reckon you're going to be legislated about it as well. So it's, mm. it's happened in the electronics industry for decades is they are, you know, companies don't offer refurbishment electronics schemes because they want to, they do it because they have to. Um, mm. And that's going to be coming to, to us, I think, in the retail space too. So, and actually number five, I'll give you another five year one. I'd seriously consider going along the B Corp route, not, mm just because it's a sustainability piece, but because everyone I speak to who has done it has said it has become the best method for managing their business. Because it's not a once and done tick box thing. It's a whole process about evaluating your whole business and making it better and stronger. And the stats that come out of uh, the B Labs team are that companies who have gone through it grow faster than those who haven't. So. So yeah, let's chuck that one in there for five years as yeah. well. Get get yourself properly, properly focused on obtaining a B B Corp certification. Yeah. You know what? You'll be you'll be starting your own e-commerce business soon, won't you? With all of this, you've just <laughs> taught yourself in to start selling. <laughs> if I ever, I'm not a product person. I just have, <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. Could no, be no. D DVD series. Go to the letterbox. <laughs> yeah let's do let's do do um rentable dvds technically <laughs> lower carbon footprint than streaming off netflix so wow we should all go retro chloe thank you so much for your time my pleasure lovely an to absolute you. pleasure you know what and i hope that in t another 20 years time we're still here <laughs> talking about e-commerce <laughs> i would love to see the demographics tuning in if we are <laughs> <laughs> 
I was going to say two sixty yeah. olds, but I don't actually know how old you are, Ian. But two sixty something, yeah. I would, I would take a rough punt. Yeah. We'll be probably <laughs> sitting in armchairs, maybe. But yeah, yeah. maybe we're retired. We'll just, we'll just be checking our Shopify app, see how much sales we've made. <laughs> Trying to work out where the pinging noise is coming from. <laughs> yeah, turn that ping off. God's sake, you know you're successful when you, when your ping annoys you on Shopify. That's when you know you, you, you're doing too well. <laughs> right. Thank you, Chuck, Chloe. Thanks, Ian. Speak to you soon. Bye.